So, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my over the moon pleasure to be presenting to you today our guest speaker, uh, Jack Alberstam. Uh, Jack Alberstam is Professor of Gender Studies and English at Columbia University, is the author of six books, uh, Skin Shows, Female Masculinity, In a Queer Time and Place, The Queer Art of Failure, Gaga Feminism, and most recently, a short book titled Trans Asterisk, a quick and quirky account of gender variance. This year, Places Journal awarded Alberstam its Arthur's Places Prize for innovative public scholarship on the relationship between gender, sexuality, and the built environment. <coughs> Through his thought provocative, grounded analysis of embodiment, power, and culture, Alberstam has shaped, undone, and paved the way again to several generations of students, researchers, and other thinkers engaged in, in trans uh, studies. He has created beautifully crafted metaphors and ways of phrasing the world that have changed our personal, intellectual, and political lives forever. And for the better, especially when we often fail and can now feel queerer about it. His decision to speak of highly complex matters in accessible ways that will resonate with most diverse audiences reminds us of the value of language and the importance of communication as an ethical human <coughs> duty. Alberstam's work is one of the reasons why I and many of us here today find actually pleasure and hope in the academic work we do. Alberstam is currently working on several projects, including a book titled Wild Thing, Queer Theory After Nature, on queer anarchy, performance and protest culture, the intersections between animality, the human and the environment. So may we uh, welcome Professor Oberstam here today. Thank you so much. Thank you to Christina for that lovely introduction. Thank you all for being here on a difficult day for transportation. Uh, I appreciate that uh, you made it. Um, I'm very excited about the theme of this conference and I'm going, of queering friendship, which is, it, it's such an important and uh, provocative topic, uh, especially at a time when we have decided to pursue new forms of kinship, you know, and I'll talk about that a little bit today in terms of these new forms of the household, sometimes scripted by gay marriage, other times by trans children. Um, something about trans kinship still strikes me as quite conservative and accommodationist, whereas queer friendship was always the promise of queer politics. It was always a promise that queers would value different forms of intimacy than those that structured heteronormative life. And I don't think we've always lived up to that promise. And I think that the recent orientation towards marriage and family suggests rather that we have capitulated to dominant social forms rather than uh, investing in the social forms that have become characteristic of queer life at least uh, in the 20th century. Now into the 21st century, we look as if we have been co-opted co really uh, by dominant forms. And this at a time, by the way, when family, the concept of family and the concept of marriage uh, is very unstable even in heteronormative con uh, contexts. So the return to friendship, it seems to me is a really, it's a radical, turn. It's asking of us that we think about different scripts for human relation that are not organized by the biological, that do not simply result in the family home, uh, and that have within them, within these new scripts, other ways of being in relation, period. Other scripts for intimacy and new ways of thinking about collectivity. So that's the promise of friendship. Um, I'm going to try to talk through some of these ideas about new scripts for being in relation using two different paradigms. First, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit from my book on trans asterisks about 
what the emergence of trans children uh, in the last 10 years means for the way that we are thinking about kinship. And then in the second half of my talk, to echo something that Christina suggested, I want to move towards the uh, concept of unmaking the world, unbuilding, undoing uh, the logics of association that we have. And I'll use the example of architecture, and architecture and digital architecture to do so. So those are the two dynamics uh, that I'm interested in. Why do I use the asterisks in relationship to trans? Um, here, I'm trying to think about all the different bodies that uh, gather under the sign of trans. And so it's important to recognize that trans is not simply about people who have had or plan to have sex reassignment surgeries. At this point, trans includes many different kinds of bodies, uh, many different forms of gender. Uh, and even though the impulse is to reformulate the binary so that trans people who move from female to male become recognizable as trans men, and then trans bodies that move from female to, to male to female are recognizable as trans women, the asterisk proposes that we do something else with trans and that we put pressure to the whole system of gender in the first place through this category, right? So that, again, I'm interested in the kind of promise that comes out of these, these queer concepts and then the way in which sometimes they collapse under the weight of that promise, all right? So in terms of the, the asterisk, the asterisk in a database search online usually means and more of the these, this category. So it means trans and more of this category that maybe can't even be named. The asterisk, after all, is what in English we call a diacritical mark. Um, it belongs to uh, a set of marks that we use to emphasize or vary language, like a question mark or an exclamation mark. So the asterisk <coughs> is suggesting that the way in which gender works across different communities exceeds our ability to name it, okay? So we've almost like run out of language for talking about the multiplicity of gender. Uh, and again, you can see Facebook quickly rushing in to commodify that with its 50 ways you can identify on Facebook. But there are other things politically that we can do with the excess that the asterisk uh, marks. Okay, so in the past, uh, it, it's interesting at this particular moment to look back on how trans has been represented. And for those of you old enough to recognize this film still, does anybody recognize it? Dress to Kill. Thank you. Dress to Kill from the 1980s. Uh, brilliant uh, but, but troubling film. Um, this is just a reminder that not very long ago, trans people only appeared in mainstream representation as serial killers, weirdly, because I, I actually don't know a single case of a trans woman who has been found to be a serial killer. I know a million cases of white straight men who are serial killers. I don't see tons of films about that. I don't see that becoming the marker of what is dangerous about white masculinity. But in the 80s and 90s, there were an extraordinary number of films in which trans women were represented as serial killers. And Dress to Kill was one of the most complex versions of this narrative. Uh, and it concerned uh, Michael, uh, the character Michael Caine, played a psychoanalyst by day and a serial killer by night who dressed as a woman and went on a killing rampage to kill the women whom he could not become. Because he could not be a woman, he destroyed women, right? More likely to do that as a male psychoanalyst, I think, than as a <laughs> trans woman. Uh, there's a nonsense aspect to this narrative, but it was completely accepted at that time as a viable narrative, so much so that 10 years later, another film came out with the same kind of narrative, Silence of the Lambs, you'll remember. Okay? So this is a very ubiquitous understanding of what it means to be trans in the 80s and 90s. And I remind you of this because so ubiquitous is the conversation about trans now that it's very easy to forget this earlier formulation. Now what is great 
in recent years about the representation of the trans body is that there's been a move away from representing trans as singular, unique, aberrant, pathological, and dangerous, and a movement towards representing trans people in community, in relation, and within friendship. So if you think about the film Tangerine, I don't know if people have seen Tangerine. Yeah, it's great film, even though the, the director, Sean Baker, is seen as a little bit of an interloper. He's a, a straight white guy who um, made this film really on the basis of the incredible improvisational performances by the two uh, trans women in the film. But what's significant about that film is that it refuses to represent trans identity as a lonely, aberrant, singular experience. And that is the past version of its representation. So if you represent trans people as lonely and singular, then they are very easily pathologized and rendered dangerous to a community. What Tangerine does is it situates trans women in relation to one another. Now that should not be a difficult narrative or it should not be rare to see that since trans people mostly take refuge with other tra trans people. That's, trans community is actually a thing. It's a, it's a really important thing. The only other film I've seen that does this is by Hawker by Crook, by Silas Howard and Harry Dodge, and that came out a lot earlier, um, some nearly two decades ago, and that film was about the friendship between two trans men, and that made it very, very radical at the time that it came out. So Tangerine is sort of picking up on a current in which you can completely transform the representation of trans people. <coughs> How? By putting one more trans person in the frame at the same time. And then making the meaning of trans be something that reflects off of and circulates between the trans bodies, rather than always being triangulated by a normative body that represents the status quo. Do you see? So some of these films, like By Hook or By Crook, remove any sign of normative community. There is no heteronormative community in By Hook or By Crook. There is only the queer and trans world of a dying, the last days of queer San Francisco before the Google boom, okay? So it's interesting that in that moment, before social media, before Google, before San Francisco was taken over by digital technology, in that little now, what looks like a utopian moment, there's this very, very independent film about trans friendship. And that's where I think we find some of the most renegade images of trans life, is where we see trans people in relationship to each other, okay? So this is uh, the little book that um, I wrote, just, you know, not really to do incredibly new work uh, in the field, so much as to offer a little primer for people who maybe don't understand why we're suddenly talking about transgender issues um, in the last five years. And I will say, historically speaking, that the representation of trans community has been completely transformed in literally a tiny, tiny period of time. So on the one hand, you have like three decades of trans activism leading up to this moment, which is completely ignored by the press. And then you have a sort of wave of representations of trans life and trans issues and bathroom debates, right? And suddenly, uh, in Europe and in the US, uh, neoliberal societies are engulfed in discussions about transgender people. We should be super excited about that on the one hand and very worried on the other, on the other hand. Why? Why in neoliberal capital are people so interested in trans bodies? And at least one answer is that they represent a new market, not least among medical technologies uh, and medical procedures. Uh, but second, at a time of deepening polarization in many societies, in deep moments of deep, deep exploitation uh, in capitalist terms, and in xenophobic times in which immigrants are blamed for everything, the acceptance of trans people, particularly white, middle-class trans people, makes the state look benevolent. And I know that's really cynical, 
but I at least ask you to entertain the possibility that the conversation that we're now having about trans people is not wholly something that we should celebrate. It might be something that we need to investigate further. And I'm going to make that argument a few times uh, over the course of this talk. I make that argument in this book, which is possibly why it hasn't, uh, in, in some ways, hasn't entered into the mainstream discourse on transgender issues, because there is an absolute commitment to representing the world that we live in as progressing along a political arc that gets better and better and more and more expansive. And even Facebook will recognize that you are a blah, 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 you know, name your identity here, right? And then we feel sort of good about these forms of micro recognition when in fact they mean nothing materially very often, particularly to poor trans people and trans people of color and trans sex workers, it means nothing to be recognized on Facebook. Uh, but in the meantime, the energy moves away from precarious populations and is firmly directed at middle class communities who now become part of this massive middle class um, that is seen to be the benefactors of neoliberal capital accumulation. So it's not a happy narrative, um, and um, it's going to get a little bit worse, okay, I promise, as we go. <laughs> Starting with trans children. Uh, and trans children, I think the emergence of trans children is where you can see this narrative that I'm, I'm going to stick to, uh, but we can debate, um, most clearly outlined is in relationship to the trans child. And people will remember here Lee Edelman's argument in No Future, that politics and political projects that are built around children often harbor within them deeply conservative and normative orientations to futurity precisely because they're using a kind of reproductive alibi through which there's a reproduction of the same. So we think, you know, remember Edelman's point, you cannot be against the child. Similarly, you cannot be against the trans child. Let me see if I can change that a little bit. Okay, so there's a lot of things to say about the emergence of trans children. Um, so here's a pro one proposition. The instability of childhood means that gender is necessarily uncertain before heteronormative family dynamics shape it into something clear and true. All children are unstable subjects, all children. All children go through periods of time in which their gender affiliations switch. Uh, even normative children normative children who will become heterosexual cisgendered adults will gender switch throughout their early childhood precisely because ch in childhood gender is unstable. Why? It doesn't need to be stable. You are not a reproductive subject. The society does not need you to be a stable base. It actually allows for a certain kind of flexibility and the more flexibility the more it seems like the adult outcome is natural, is natural, because all possibilities have been allowed. In actual fact, childhood is a deeply inscribed experience for most people, a deeply ideological process, uh, where the outcome is uh, sort of predetermined that whatever instability exists within childhood, normative men and women must emerge uh, from the process. And in relationship to the trans child, that narrative, that script, is no different. So the trans child often presents themselves, needs to be then stabilized, and then produced through very similar uh, social norms to any other cisgendered male or female person who emerges out of the sort of revolutionary moments of adolescence. Back to the Edelman, remember that even as we invest in the possibilities and potentialities that children represent, children can also be the vectors for some of the most conservative ideas in any given culture. And in the post-war period in Europe and the US, there were numerous films about this, precisely because the specter of Nazi youth had reminded people that if you take hold of children at a young age and you ideologically indoctrinate them, they can become the most uh, energetic enforcers of even very, very dark uh, political um, truths. And 
This was the kind of concern that people like Ariel Dorferman had. Um, he wrote a book about the exploitation of Mickey Mouse and Disney cartoons to Latin America. And he suggested that Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse were being used around the world to indoctrinate children, particularly in Latin America, into North American ways of thinking. So this is from a, a film called The Village of the Damned, in which um, children in one village have been turned into uh, sort of alien monsters. And notice this is a post-war film. The blonde hair, the blue eyes are the markers of childhood transformation into something very, very noxious and dangerous. And they then turn on their parents. Now, I'm not saying we're in that moment, uh, but there is a generational divide nowadays um, in queer and trans communities. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that an older generation of trans people came out without support to a very hostile environment and fought for a very um, radical, political orientation to the world through their experience as being trans, okay? In more recent times, trans children have been supported, which is great, by their parents, have been fed through a social services system that administers hormones and proposes medical interventions for them, and then are delivered at the other end to an adulthood in which they don't think about themselves as trans, but understand themselves as male and female. And I was just talking to a 22-year-old in Germany, and I said, well, how has it been for you transitioning here um, and being trans? And he said, oh, I'm, I don't think about myself as trans. I'm a man. And of course he is a man. I don't at all dispute that. And yet, the category of trans has been very meaningful, as many people at this conference I know from, from reading the program have argued, it's been a very meaningful jumping off point, springboard, if you like, for thinking about how to take apart the gender binary, heteronormativity, uh, normative forms of domesticity, and so on. So if we lose trans, because trans people are just being swallowed up into the normative categories of male and female, we didn't des destabilize anything. We, in fact, are shoring it up. So I'm quite interested in how we, who think of ourselves as outside of the dominant and the normative, may in fact be, in Foucauldian terms, the route through which stabilization and normativity um, re-enter into a possibly destabilized system. We become the place of uh, uh, equilibrium, okay? We should be disrupting, we should be disordering, and instead we are creating equilibrium. And it's very hard to say that because you cannot, it is not the fault of young trans people. That is, it is not their fault that this is now the process. But I still think we have to be able to talk about the process without blaming anyone in particular. That said, so if you look back, the, the narratives that we have of trans life for children are really different from the ones we have today. And it's worth, again, I'm, I'm somebody who studies representation. So these texts remain very important to me in terms of offering us um, some access to earlier logics of embodiment that have now been pushed aside. And these two films, both of which were European, both of which um, uh, tried to capture the hostility directed at the trans child, uh, both of them in French, uh, one's Belgian, one was produced in French, um, in France. Both of them represent trans childhood as a kind of impossibility uh, within which only the children recognize that there are possibilities beyond the male-female binary. It is the adults who are completely ill-equipped to see that there's more possibilities within these positions. So Ma Vie en Rose is about a child born male, Ludo, and this film was made in like 1994. I mean, this is incredibly early to have a film about a trans child. There's no concept of the trans child at that time. No concept of the trans child. And yet, here's a really cute film about a little person called Ludo who identifies with his mother and his grandmother, who has a fairy godmother, and who knows that he will grow up to be a woman and he will marry his best friend. As soon as there's a possibility of same-sex desire 
the film moves into its sort of transphobic, homophobic mode, and the family tries to shut Ludo down and turn him back into being a boy. And significantly in this film, it's a very cute film, the outcome is that the family moves away from the conservative suburb where they're living and moves to a more working class part of town where Ludo finds a friend. And the friend is a butch lesbian. <laughs> and it's that friendship that saves both of them from the ruination of normativity. So it, it was, I mean, back in the 1990s, here we have an alternative narrative uh, about the way in which we could think about uh, inhabiting trans bodies in relation to each other. And then Tomboy, it's a similar kind of narrative, but without the, um, the redemption uh, at the end. The, the, the girl who is interested, who passes as a boy, who understands themselves as a boy, who is in love with a girl, <coughs> that person is sort of brutally transformed by the parents back into a girl. And it's a very telling film because it explains to us how trans narratives can be managed and uh, uh, diffused and you know, shut down. But here we have today lots of little trans kids, some, many of whom as young as four years old, coming out to their parents based on things that they've read online, uh, how they feel about themselves, what they see around them, all kinds of different factors but that have essentially queered childhood and at the same time just kind of made the instability of childhood normative, rendered it somewhat normative. Okay? Not everywhere, not completely, but that's at least one script that is in play at the moment. Um, Tay Meadow, who is one of my colleagues at Columbia, has written a book called Trans Kids that I do recommend to people. And he makes some of these points uh, in, in that book. He says, he, he makes a point that the trans child is a relatively new social form. He says, we see no references to transgender children prior to the mid-1990s. That's really important. It's really important because rarely in your lifetime will you see something that so quickly, rapidly, moves from being a you know, seemingly marginalized, pathologized kind of position um, to being accepted as a category. Out of nowhere, there were no trans children, to be clear, 20 years ago. Even when the, even that film, Ma Vie en Rose, was, billed itself as more about a sort of young homosexual than about transsexuality per se. So the category of the trans child is completely and utterly new. Why? Why do we suddenly see the emergence of an understanding of transgender identity in young people? And what is the impact of this sudden emergence? So this is what Meadow says. Trans adults must cope with the deeply different trajectories and life chances of the smallest gender outlaws. Some of these children may elect to be stealth, some may never openly identify as transgender, many will never go through their natal puberties or retain childhood memory books filled with pictures that do not mirror their gender identities as adults. Generation split, right there. So that generation split that I talked about, it's not a, I'm not fantasizing it, it's a thing. And it's a thing because older trans people simply had very, very different experiences than younger trans people to the point that they're virtually irreconcilable. Virtu like if you read the two sets of narratives, they're not the same narrative. It doesn't actually even make sense to use the same terminology. Um, so what May Meadow is referring to is many people who came out as trans later in lives had a childhood that was documented in the gender that they no longer live in. You know, so you may be living as a trans man, but all of your photographs are of you as a girl. And you have to reconcile this disjuncture, okay? So I'm interested in talking with you more about this generation gap. Meadow concludes that for these reasons, a new generation may have wider, wider latitude to disidentify with transgender history and with those who came before them. And for Meadow, this is just not a big deal, just something he's saying. For these generations, this reason, new generations to disidentify with those who came before them. For me, this is a problem because the people who came before this generation of trans kids also had to be activists, 
also had to fight the good fight to even make trans into something uh, that the state would consider recognizing. So all the trans activism from the past is completely lost as a narrative, as a, an archive, uh, as a set of experiences. And instead, you just pick up a magazine that says, oh, here's um, the latest transgender celebrity. We have arrived at the transgender tipping point. Well, how did we arrive there? Because a doctor recognized a trans kid as, as somebody who was telling the truth and gave them hormones? Or were there 30 years of activism? I don't know. Uh, so the fact, and this is also um, intensified in the era of the internet, when things happen very quickly and all history is forgotten uh, in favor of the last five days of your Twitter feed where you can barely keep up, right? Uh, but what happened 10 years ago? What happened 20 years ago? Um, what happened uh, around famous cases of trans women and men who were bludgeoned and killed? Uh, trans activists would gather and try to make sure that their murderers did not get off with small fines and so on. Uh, and the activism was not for government recognition. The activism was for the dismantling of the gender system as we know it. Now, we're in danger of confirming the very gender system that we threw into chaos. That's the question that I hope we can take up. So the second section, I just have three sections, and I'll do this one more quickly to get to my concluding section, is what is cool and great about new forms of transgender community, however, is that the possibility does exist for trans kinship, for remaking kinship completely, and rethinking, like, we have a generational divide, but using terms like intimacy, friendship, and trans asterisk kinship, we could reconnect across the gener generational divide in favor of a much larger political project than the ones that we currently engage. So that's what I want to, on the one hand, I'm making a critique, and I'm sure that some people will not like it. On the other hand, what I want to say is I'm making the critique because I think it's very unfortunate that a lot of young trans people blame older people and a lot of older people feel unrecognized by uh, trans youth and that creates a divide where there needs to be solidarity in deeply divisive political moments. Deep, we're in a deep crisis and our problem is not each other. But one of the great successful outcomes of right-wing politics in the last five years has been to set left, it, leftist communities at odds with each other. One example would be the fight about TERFs among trans women, the fight uh, that trans women are waging against trans-exclusionary radical feminists. I don't say that TERFs are not hateful, they are, this is a very hateful ideology, but honestly, this is not a large number of people compared to white normative men who are the people, after all, who are threatening your life, not just denying you access to some tiny women-only space. Are there women-only spaces anymore? I don't really see them. I, I, I don't know where those are. I don't know why you'd want to go into them anyway. Um, at this moment <laughs> of proliferating genders, women-only space? I don't think so. I don't see that. Um, so, while we do have movements of trans-exclusionary radical feminists, they can't possibly be our most important enemy. They can't be, they just aren't, okay? So pushing forward, we need to start thinking across these divides that we have allowed and that are part of the recuperation of trans-induced instability and that ha has been fostered by neoliberal uh, ideologies that we need to be aware of and dispute and refuse. Okay, so that's, that's the argument here. So here's the next proposition. While mass media simply places a trans body within an ever-expanding scene of political reg recognition um, as evidence of the rightness of the current political order, that's the argument I've made so far, the emergence of the trans child is very much a consequence of the digital circulation of <coughs> images and narratives about trans lives. So, uh, in, in other words, we have created as well a, a deep and important archive about trans life and we should go back to that archive to remember who we are and what we've been saying about trans rather than 
just capitulating to mainstream authored narratives uh, about how great the family is that it accepts the trans child and how marvelous these parents are. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. But we don't want trans parents to be the author of new trans activism. Okay, because that's not necessarily the experience of the world that they have had. But trans activists from the past, older trans activists, have had the experience of being trans. So when you cut off trans kids from older trans activists and replace them with parents, and that becomes the access that the trans child has to the world, you necessarily inscribe new forms of normativity. Um, one way of rethinking kinship is available to us through the anthropolo anthropological theory of Marilyn Straffen, that, to which many people are returning, I notice, precisely because we no longer live in the era of the biological family. We just don't. Most households are the products of some form of intervention into that concept of the natural or biological family. People get divorced. People use IVF, there are gay and lesbian families, <coughs> trans families, adopted families, there are immigrant families that fall outside of the logic of normativity. Most households are not simple biological forms of kinship. So Strathen's work from the 1990s recognized that kinship was radically changing. And she proposed something <coughs> she called the mirographic method. Mirographic. Mirographic comes from some combination of Greek and Latin that means uh, writing about partiality. Writing about the part, not the whole. The part, not the whole. So in the past, in kinship context, we've written about the family as a whole. It's mom, dad, fam uh, kids, bloodlines, genealogies, and that's understood to be kinship. The mirographic method suggests that kinship is fractured, fragmentary, improvised, and constantly changing. Therefore, we need another method in order to track forms of kinship that I think in the context of this conference could be understood much better in relationship to new improvised flows of intimacy on the one hand, and new meanings of friendship on the other hand. Improvised communities that take care of each other, um, Friendship, uh, let's say friendship separate from Facebook friendship, okay? Because that's another one of these neoliberal accumulations, turning friendship into a platform for capital accumulation, uh, as opposed to friendship as the platform for care, intimacy, support, fun, pleasure, uh, alternative communities, all of those things are the opposite of, friend of Facebook the very opposite. We didn't see that in the early years of Facebook, but I think we surely see it now at the very moment that we are aware of the fact that the American elections at least were engineered partly through Facebook, um, through hacking that went on through Facebook uh, networks. Why are we still on Facebook? Why? Why are we still on Twitter? These are multi-million dollar corporations that use your online profile to mine your data, <laughs> to uh, basically circulate all kinds of noxious ideologies, uh, and to alter and distort our understandings of who we are and what kinds of relations we might be in. So if you go on your Twitter feed, and this is apparently what happened to the person that Christina was talking about this morning, if you go on your Twitter feed and there's a fight between two people you know, and many people have weighed in, you would think this was the most important thing happening in the world today. You're like, oh my God, look. Oh, look, there's pages of this. Oh, so many people are involved. Do you know how many people are actually involved in that? Like seven, okay? <laughs> it, 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 isn't, it isn't the most important thing happening. But we can no longer see outside of that digital life uh, until all of the, again, bad message, it's, it's not a good message, but all of the promise of, you know, organizing political revolt through our online communities, how did that go? I don't see tons of revolt. I don't, my Facebook feed wasn't full of, hey, let's meet here and blow up the White House. You know, I didn't see that. I 
saw a lot of infighting. I saw one incident being blown up as if it was the only incident. Um, I saw people feeling completely uh, uh, authorized to call each other names uh, and engage in the most ugly, ugly of exchanges. It's the opposite of friendship. It's the very opposite of friendship. You know, in real life, when you, don't, when you get into a fight with a friend, you don't block them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You don't, you know, like, that's it. We're done. You don't see them for a while, and then maybe you come back around, and you run into each other, and you move on. And that's what friendship is. It's up, it's down, things happen, people break up, get back together, but they see each other every now and then, in real time, right? I was in fights on social media with people I've never met, and I will never met. That's insane. I don't care about those people. So we are infiltrated now in ways that are so, it's so damaging to who we are as a community and what we might mean by friendship or intimacy uh, that I think the most radical thing to do would be as a, as a mass to go offline, to go dark, and to find other um, circuits of communication and access. All right. So a few <coughs> remarks to conclude this section and then I'll move towards architecture by way of a bigger uh, conclusion. So here it is. Online communication has intensified the orientation of gender cross-identified young people towards medical explanations and fixes for the experience of cross-gender identification. How could it not? If you're, if you're a five-year-old and you feel like you're not a girl, you're a boy, you're not a boy, you're a girl, look it up. Look it up online. You will get millions of YouTube videos that will explain to you who you are and at five, that becomes then your reality of who you are, okay? So there are other things that we do as trans people. We don't only look for medical fixes. There are many, many other ways that we identify as trans and have identified as trans. Those, those ways of identifying, I see them kind of making a comeback now among young people I teach, but at least for, for the last 10 years, we have come more and more to think about trans as a kind of medical production of self. Surgeries, hormones, and so on. And many young people demand of their cis normative parents that this medical intervention needs to happen and the parents deliver it to them. Two, online communities make transition seem magical. If you go online and you see a YouTuber saying, hey guys, I started taking testosterone today, and then time lapse. Here I am, three months later, I got, you know, I got facial hair, look at my muscles, it, this is awesome, dude. Time lapse, time lapse. Oh my God, my voice has dropped. You know? So it's like the kid is watching the online transition that took two years in three minutes. It looks magical. It's not magical. Surgeries are real. They're, someone's cutting into your body. And uh, I know this having, had top surgery at the age of 54, it's, it, it's no joke, it's not something, especially at a late age, when you get these surgeries, they're not magical. Bottom surgeries, still some 60% of trans people do not get bottom surgeries because they are not that easy to pull off and they create incredible discomfort for many people. But we are not talking about that. We are just acting as if anything can happen uh, through sex, re we, the fact that we even have this term, sex reassignment surgery. It, it isn't a surgery, it's surgeries. And it's quite a few of them, by the way, and they don't all work. And they're not all a simple procedure that you go in, you come out, and there you are. It isn't like that. Hormones do have a kind of magical effect, but we have no idea what the long-term implications are of somebody beginning testosterone at 14. How will that person, or, or a trans woman beginning estrogen very early on? We know that female bodies stop making estrogen menopausally because estrogen is quite toxic in later, later life, something that the medical industry doesn't want to tell you because they'd rather you bought to, uh, estrogen. So where's all the studies? If we want to do the medical route, where's all the studies of the long-term impact of hormones? I'd like to see them. I'd like to know more about that. But again, it's not the conversation.
Online discussions at Tumblr and elsewhere flatten out incredibly complicated political landscapes of identity and identification for young trans people. Simple. I'm not making a big attack on young people. I'm just saying that if you learn about this stuff online, the complexity is often lost in favor of people shouting at each other about pronoun use. The intersection, and this is where I'm going to segue into my last uh, section. The intersection of capitalism and queer or trans desire has not always been disruptive. I know we want to believe that, but um, actually there are numerous cases of queer people, for example, being the vanguard of gentrification very often in many cities around the world, particularly white gay male communities, are the vanguard of gentrification. They're not the people criticizing gentrification, they're creating it. Going back to the 1980s in San Francisco, there were massive swathes of the city that were taken over by gay capital, and then you see a huge uh, bust in that economy in the era of the AIDS crisis, and then there's a return, a boom time um, post-AIDS. So we would be wrong if we thought that queer people were simply always on the outside of capitalism, and trans communities too. New models of kinship, identity, and transition are required then, and this is what I understand the project of intimacy in part to be, to make sense of trans and queer bodies within new formulations of time, space, and capital. And that means, by the way, not letting ourselves off the hook. We are accountable. We also are part of new forms of accumulation of capital. We also are agents for uh, co-optation, for assimilation, uh, for you know, the extension of state authorized forms of normativity. We are not the place that normativity goes to die always and everywhere. We often are, in fact, the extension of neoliberal uh, mechanisms. And that's because neoliberalism doesn't work through exclusion, it works through inclusion. All right, so there it is, the dystopia, as promised um, in my title. Um, so I, my work, and Christina laid this out beautifully, has often been written in a kind of negative vein, where the negative is not simply critique. In my work, I often call for unbuilding, undoing, and unmaking. And female masculinity in many ways was that. It was like, what happens when female bodies unmake their own femininity and enact a different kind of logic? Uh, but in the Queer Art of Failure too, I said, what if success is merely the way to consolidate power? What if we actually have to attend to mechanisms of failure in order to bring together anti-capitalism with queer um, politics? So similarly, my new work is about something that um, uh, is called an architecture, an architecture, which has the happy coincidence of architecture and anarchy and is connected to a political movement from the 1970s, the Anne Architects in New York City, who set out to unbuild the world. They didn't get very far, but <laughs> that shouldn't stop us. Um, I, I strongly believe that now is not the time to make things. Now is not the time to build things, especially at this moment of gentrification and intense investment in real estate. Now is the time to unbuild, beginning with social online presence, unbuild, unmake the world within which it's very hard to get out of our role as consolidating, okay? So if we're gonna be disruptors and we want to understand ourselves as politically radical, we will have to start by unmaking. So here's another proposition that will get to this architectural move. We need to move away from the concept of people who are trapped in the wrong body and who require medical interventions and towards a sense of unmaking the world that marks those bodies as wrong in the first place. Do you see what I mean? Like that's, that's a different logic as opposed to the inclusive logic of we're to here, we're trans, recognize us. This says, what is that world within which we are the wrong body? Let's unmake that world so that we cannot return to the logic of normative and deviant. You have to unmake the whole thing. You know how when you, if you go off Facebook or something, you can't just say, I'm done, I'm off. I'm, I'm not going on there anymore. You actually have to unbuild your account. You have to get into your account 
Download whatever you want from it and take the bloody thing apart. And it's not easy and it's not quick. That's what we need to do. So if you think just by opting out of something, you're done. It doesn't work that way. The thing that we have to do online to unbuild our presence, <coughs> excuse me, is very similar to I think what I'm calling for here. And that will mean being very critical of some of the online tools to which we become deeply attached. So there is an architectural turn in trans studies, it turns out. <coughs> and I, deep, I, I really highly recommend a book by Lucas Crawford. It's called something like um, Transgender Architectonics. And he produces a theory of perpetual transition um, by thinking through the logic of architecture in relationship to the trans body. The trans body is a built body, a made body. And I add to that that the trans body is also the unbuilding of the body into which you were born. You both have to unmake something in order to make something new. And I propose that we pay a little bit more attention to that unmaking piece. Um, Okay, so let's just, let me tell you a little bit about an architecture because I don't presume that everybody knows what it is. And then uh, it actually uh, takes us back to an interesting moment in gay history um, characterized by uh, gay cruising, for example, um, and a different relationship to urban space. So. Um, the, the main person in the anarchitecture movement of the 1970s was a guy called Gordon Matta Clark. He was a Chilean immigrant to New York City. His father was a famous Chilean artist. And Gordon Matta Clark, young, cisgendered, heteronormative guy, goes to Cornell, gets a degree in architecture, and says, learns everything he can about architecture, and then says, fuck it, I'm going to use this training to unbuild to unbuild everything. So it turns out that to unmake things is as complicated as making. You must be an architect in order to know how to bring something down, right? So he uses his architectural training to start unmaking and unbuilding houses. And in one, I'll just give you one example. In, in one example, he buys a house for nothing because it's the first wave of the housing boom and bust. He buys the post-war dream of the suburban home has come crashing down in the 1970s, and he's able to buy a house in New Jersey for nothing. It's foreclosed upon, I think he pays $10 for it, buys the house, takes his chainsaw and various equipment, and he splits the house open, down the middle. It's called splitting. It's, it, it was a, a performance, he filmed it, he photographed it, and you end up with this gorgeous image of a split house. And to me, that gesture is the anarchitectural gesture of taking the home apart is exactly in line with the fantasy of taking apart the system of heteronormativity. I mean, the house represents heterodomesticity anyway. The home is built to contain a family with the master bedroom for the most important people in the house, the, the, the marital couple, the children's rooms that are necessarily smaller, right? The living room, the dining room, the kitchen, Architectures already impose normativity upon the worlds that we live in. The anarchitects wanted to take things down so that we could rebuild them differently, okay? Not rebuild them like in, in a, you know, oh, we'll build a playground here, not like that, but like reimagine architecture altogether. What would a house for friends look like? How might we build collective space into a built environment? How could we, take down walls that divide households? How could we make people think in relationship to being responsible for their neighbors? Those kinds of things can be answered architecturally. Uh, this is just an image of the piers where Gordon Matt Clark did one of his most famous works. It was called Day's End, and he cut uh, all kinds of holes into the piers, letting in light and water. The piers were the end of the shipping industry in New York, the aftermath of it. They were part of an industrial collapse that characterized New York in the 1970s, <coughs> and they were abandoned uh, by industry, police, everyone. For that reason, they became a place that gay men went to cruise. And there's many a gay memoir from this time by Samuel Delaney, Douglas Crimp, 
uh, uh, David Wanderovich, that mention the peers. And the, the, the cruising that went on there was also part, you know, part of the cruising was people making art. David Wanderovich's most amazing uh, works appeared in the piers on the walls, just painted on the walls that would later come down. Um, and there were also homeless people there, drug addicts were there, um, all kinds of dispossessed populations inhabited the piers. Gordon Matt Clark was there, cutting into the piers and calling attention to this dystopian yet utopian potential site of another kind of community that he understood to be emergent. These are some photographs from that time by an African-American photographer, Alvin Baltrop, who often photographed the gay men in the piers against the back backdrop of the architecture within which they moved. And the architecture of the piers is really important to the mechanism of cruising that remains outside of capitalist logics. It's not the bar scene, no one's selling drinks, uh, all that anyone is selling is sex. And sex becomes the currency of that scene and is remembered by people like Samuel Delaney as deeply utopian. But this is about cruising dystopia, so I want to sort of now begin to chip away at that narrative. As Munoz reminds us, books of criticism that just glamorize the ontology of gay male cruising are more often than not simply boring. So this isn't an argument at all that gay sex is the, is the access point to utopia. It in fact, in fact, asks the question as to whether gay sex, as it moves from cruising within abandoned spaces to online cruising in apps like Grindr, becomes a kind of, in, this, in, in, in the peers, was sort of a pre-consumerized activity that we now see coming to full fruition. This is the piece that Gordon Matt Clark did, Day's End. He, uh, there he was in the piers, suspended on, uh, by a harness, hanging from the ceiling, cutting these massive semicircles into the piers. And one of the things that he did that was so difficult was he cut into buildings that were already unstable, which I hope is a very potent metaphor for what I'm talking about. And he didn't do so to stabilize them. He did so to bring them to the point of collapse, but not to collapse them. And that is where you need a training in architecture. Because if you remove the wrong thing, the whole thing comes crashing down and people get hurt. So I'm not at all just saying we need to bring everything down and who cares who, who gets hurt. I'm saying we need to find exactly the point he was looking for, which is the place where something is on the point of collapse, but still standing. And that's what he did. And in the process, he introduced light and water into, this, into the space and turned it from being a grimy, uh, uh, dark, space of disease and decay uh, and destitution, it was all of those things, but it also was a place that was you know, flooded with light reflecting off of water and was turned into a very, very different kind of space. This is Albert Baltrop's uh, imagery of the piers. You can see it's a really different architecture to the ones that we live with now. An abandoned building in the 70s, by the way, was immediately squatted. How did you get around housing problems in the 70s? You squatted. You can't squat a luxury building now. You can't get anywhere near it. You can't get in the door of it, right? So we now also live in a time where there are too many housing, uh, too many uh, apartments that sit empty because they're investment properties and millions of people on the street, okay? But those people cannot go and squat anywhere unlike in the 1970s. So it's really different understanding of space and architecture. Another Altrop, uh, Baltrop photographs, you can see always the backdrop is the architectural. And reminding us that the, the site of the cruising was as important as the cruising itself. Okay. However, uh, we are no longer in that uh, period. We don't, we don't cruise that way uh, any longer. Um, we are, have now seen the complete um, gathering up of the activity of cruising and the transformation of it into a platform for massive capital exploitation. <laughs> and that's what Green Grinder is. And even the Grinder, uh, the people who make Grinder don't deny that. Um, and so worried are they about the transparent nature of their app that it's about gathering information, 
that it uh, actually favors white gay men because many men on Grindr for a long time would say no fat people, no femmes, no Asians, no blacks, whatever it may be. They felt completely okay about uh, tra you know, transmitting racist desires because it's their desire. You can't, you can't say it's wrong. That's their desire, right? So, so aware of that, our grinder that they've actually hired a, an amazing young man of color, Zach Stafford, to change their image globally. Okay, so I'm not just like the person standing outside critiquing it. They are aware that they have an image problem. They've hired someone, and he has great ideas, but he himself is deeply critical of grinder. And so what I'm saying is that, um, the, that grinder, in one fell swoop, and this is the danger of social media architectures, has transformed the subtle geometries of cruising through which gay men created friendships, communities, uh, lasting uh, sexual subterranean worlds. Through one change of platform, we now have algorithms for consumption and circulation that have taken the worn circuits of gay cruising and turn them into avenues for massive amounts of capital flow. Okay, so this should be, I hope, one of these examples of the way in which social media collaborates with new forms of social identity and new forms of recognition only to deliver queer and trans people back to uh, capital. Um, Tinder also uses uh, fancy alibis for what it's actually doing, and I was on a panel with um, the guy who created Tinder uh, early on. And, um, you know, I was making my critique already. This was like seven years ago, or whenever it came out. And the guy who made Tinder, he, he hops up, you know, he's like trained in public speaking. So he's like, at Tinder, you know, our business is building successful relationships. <laughs> and I was like, um, what is a successful relationship? I'm just wondering. Marriage was his answer. I was like, isn't it a hookup ad, uh, uh, app? I mean, I'm no judgment, but isn't it a hookup app? He's like, yeah, but you'd be amazed how many people find their, their, their person there. I said, do they? They swipe left or right and they find their person. And how long does that relationship last? Do you care? I mean, if they get married in Las Vegas after swiping left or right and it lasts three days, does that go down as a successful relationship? Could be. But you need a different criteria than marriage in order to figure out what that is. So this idea, marriage now becomes the alibi for what is actually the business that these apps are there for, which is to use sex, as Foucault predicted, not as a site for resistance, but as a new uh, activation of desire for consumer purposes. That's it. That's what these apps are. Um, and in the process, gay men and some trans people are turned into model consumers not at all an obstacle to capitalism, but in fact a conduit for faster connections between people, between people and commodities of desire, um, uh, between uh, bodies and sex. Uh, so, final proposition then, it's time to become illegible in the terms that capitalism prefers. Sex is not transgression. Gender crossing is hardly new or dangerous at this point, and in fact, rather than becoming men and women, we should be noting the breakdown of systems of classification that in the past relied upon the abjection of queer bodies. Now, now those same bodies are recruited by new economies and new media, and legibility itself has become a commodity function. So, um, let me end then, something slightly utopic. Um, how do we, what would that mean to become illegible? I don't know, but uh, the Lego movie actually had some interesting ideas about this. Has anyone seen the Lego movie? Okay, great. Well, if you've even played with Legos, you'll know that the potential of Legos is that anything that you make can easily be unmade as well. You simply destroy it, pull it apart the next day and you make something else. So the principle of Lego, uh, of uh, Lego world, Lego land, the Lego movie, is that people live in, in a place called Legoburg, where they are ideologically indoctrinated by a song. It's only one song. It's like the song that plays over and over again, and it's, it, the song is, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome, and everyone has it in their head, and they're like, oh, you gotta sing this song. But the, 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 the city has a utopian past, 
because the people who live there are either builders or architects, everyone, builders or architects. And every day they make a new world and every night they unbuild it. And then the next day they build it again. Well, this makes them very difficult to govern. And so, <laughs> Lord Business, who looks a lot like Trump, even though this was made before Trump, um, Lord Business, and that's his name in the film, comes along and says, I can't, I can't rule this city. I can't even understand what the city is from one day to the next. Therefore, I need to do something. So he comes along with super glue to build, stick everything in place. That's what neoliberalism is, is super glue. You take all the flexibility and all the transition and all the movement in the society and you stick it, stick it in place. So there's a little dynamic duo. He's really not dynamic, just by the way, he's an accidental hero. The real architect of resistance is a girl called Wild Style. And she knows that in all Lego systems, there is something called the piece de resistance uh, and you have to find it. So they go on a quest to find the piece de resistance, which is the super glue cap. And it has the advantage of being a little bit phallic and a little bit invaginated because it's a little tiny phallus and it's also got a cavity inside of it. So it's a little trans piece. And they use it to stop the super glue and create free flow. And that's a little bit of what I'm proposing by way of combating cruising dystopia. Thanks.